So, I am continuing with my AWS series here. I've already done a video on EC2, ECS, and Lambda. And today, we're going to talk about S3, Scalable Storage Service. When we talk about S3, we are talking about storing files in the cloud. You can think of S3 like Dropbox, only with a terrible UI. Terrible UI, you say? Then why not just use Dropbox when you need to store files? Great question. S3 isn't meant to be interacted with from a UI. It's meant to be interacted with through code. So when you have files that are dynamically created through an application, S3 is a great solution. I'm talking about something like a user profile image that they take themselves and upload to your server, or any static asset that you want to be able to change dynamically without having to redeploy code, or even something like a database backup that is automatically generated from your app. S3 is a great place to store things like that. S3 also has dynamic pricing. You only pay for what you use. There's no monthly plan or anything like that. And the free tier is pretty beast. It gives you some decent mileage before you have to throw down on it. S3 is your bread and butter on AWS. It's probably the single service that I use more than any other one. And I'm going to show you how to use it on an always be coding screencast. Okay, I'm gonna hit S3 to get started. And the core abstraction that we're dealing with here is something called a bucket. I already have a bunch of buckets chilling out over here that you can just ignore for now. Now, a bucket is essentially a namespace, or you can think of it like a top level folder that you can have other folders and files inside of. We're gonna create a new bucket now. And when you make a bucket, the name you use for the bucket has to be unique across all other buckets on AWS. So I normally use ABC as a namespace. I will call this ABC screencast example. 01 and I will use US standard as my region and hit create. So there we go. I made a bucket. I can click on the bucket to go inside of it. And hey, look, we've got our, you know, terrible UI over here. So I'm going to click upload to upload a file to this, add files. And I'm on my desktop. I will hit johnwall.png, which is just an image of John Wall. Hit start upload. And this should look familiar to anyone that's used anything like Dropbox or Flickr before we uploaded our file. I can click on it, open it in my browser, and there it is, John Wall. Now, you can see this link that it generated for us has got a lot of kind of stuff attached to it. It's got this signature, it has an expiration timestamp and a date timestamp and a lot of nonsense. If I wanted to just share this image using just the PNG link, it actually wouldn't work. It would give me an error saying access denied. It's because by default, when you upload images or files to S3, it adds a lot of metadata on it, including the access permissions, the amount of time these links are valid for before they expire. There's a lot of default security measures baked in. Chances are when you're just starting out with this stuff, you don't want to deal with any of that. So the solution is to right click on it and click make public. Once you make a file public, that means you can just share that link that we had right here. So if I just hit enter now, once the file has been made public, I have access to it. Uh, another good thing you can do is go to properties over here. These are properties of the entire bucket. If I get out of this and then go back to properties. So these are properties for this entire bucket. So I can go to permissions, add more permissions, grantee everyone, view permissions and hit save. And that, now any file that I upload to this bucket will be publicly accessible and I can share it from this link. So now let's interact with our S3 bucket through code. AWS provides an SDK library for almost every programming language. So it really doesn't matter what language you're using, the workflow is gonna be exactly the same. I'm using a Rails app here, but again, it really doesn't matter. So let me install the AWS SDK library by including it in my gem file. One thing that's important to note, there's actually two versions of this library. There's the 1.x branch and the 2.x branch. Chances are, if you're watching the screencast, you wanna be using the 2.x branch, and I can specify that by just saying greater than 2.0.0. Then you need to have an initializer file that runs this initialization function, aws.config.update. You need to pass in the region, and that region needs to map 
to the um, region you used when you created your S3 bucket. In my case, I created it with US standard, but US East 1 maps to US standard, so that's fine. Credentials, you need to pass your AWS credentials, your public key and your private key. If you don't have an AWS key pair, you can go create one from the security credentials option right here. Then after I bundle my gems, I can run Rails console, and I can initialize a new client for S3 by doing AWS colon colon S3 colon colon client dot new, and I will store that in a variable that I call S3 client. And then if I want to get a list of all the buckets associated with my AWS account, I can call S3 client dot list buckets. And there we go. That's a list of all the buckets associated with my S3 account. Now, in addition to having buckets, all those files that live inside the buckets are what AWS refers to as objects. And chances are when you're operating on AWS, you want to be running operations on objects, either uploading new ones or getting the content of existing objects. So let's try to list all the objects inside one of the buckets. I can do that by doing S3 client dot list objects and then pass in the bucket name which I will do as ABC screencast example 01. And that gives me a list of all the objects I have. In this case, it's just this one guy right here. Just for a sanity check, let's try adding a new file and then querying it to make sure it works. So let me quickly just touch temp.txt and echo this is an example file and we will pipe that into temp.txt. And then let's go back to our bucket here and let's upload a new file, add file, temp.txt, start upload, and then go back to our console over here and rerun the list objects. And you'll see that we have two objects now, John Wall PNG and temp.txt. Now this Ob this property here, key, is really important. When you look for an object inside of a bucket, the key has to be unique. If this was inside of a folder, a folder would just namespace this key with the namespace of the folder. But that's all that a folder does, just namespacing the key. You can always access an AWS object from its key. And keys need to be unique inside of a bucket. So let's try to get the content of this file from its key. We know that the key is temp.txt. So if I do s3 client dot get object instead of list object, and then pass the bucket, which we know is ABC screencast example 01, and then the key, which we know is temp.txt, that should get actual access to the file itself. And if we wanted to see the contents, we could do dot body dot read, and that would give us the contents of that file. Okay, so now I'm gonna upload an object into the bucket. John Wall's getting a bit lonely in there. I'm gonna upload a picture of Bradley Beal. I can open a local file on my file system by doing file.open and then the path to the file, do as file. And then instead of running s3 client.get objects, we're gonna run s3 client.put object which will take the bucket name, which is ABC screencast example 01. It'll take the key that we want for the object we're about to upload. I'm gonna just call this Bradley Beal. We don't necessarily need the extension because Amazon will know it's a .png file just because of the data in the file. And then we do body file. And just as an aside, by default, when you upload files through the AWS SDK, they are not going to be publicly accessible. If you want them to have that public read option on it, you need to pass that as a parameter of ACL and then pass in the public read right there. Uh, and then let's hit end. And it looked like that worked. It uploaded the file. And if we go back to our AWS console and refresh, we'll see that we have an image of Bradley Beal and I can click on it and it will open in my browser. So sometimes you don't have direct access to the file that you want to upload, but you do have access to the raw file data or the raw image data. Let me show you an example of what I mean. So I have a script that I wrote that can take a search string and go to Google Images, search for the first image result and pull the image data from the first image result. So I will run my get image script and I'm going to pass in the browser instance and 
in the essence of uploading the Wizards roster to S3, I'm gonna pass in Mark Keith Morris and hit enter. So you can see the browser goes to Google Images, it'll enter his name, it'll get the first image and it'll pull out the image data. And you can see right here, this isn't a file per se, but it is this really complicated string that represents the image, the actual bytes of the image. So we can upload this directly to S3 as a file. First thing though, is we're gonna need to strip off this little metadata, um, data image JPEG. So let me set a variable data equal to what just returned. Do data.gsub data image slash JPEG semicolon base 64 comma, and I'm gonna replace that with nothing so that you'd have something that looked like that. And we can save this as a variable that's called raw data. And then we could base 64 decode 64 on the raw data. And then this um, byte code that's returned, we can just put this in the body of the S3 upload and upload that directly and that should work. So let's test that out. If I put that in the S3 client and I do key Markeith Morris and I do exactly what I just did here and then go to S3 and refresh. And we'll see we do have a Markeith Morris file and if I click on it, there is the image. Even though we never had a file per se, we were still able to upload it. So now that we know that we can do something like that, we could do something really fun. So I have here the entire Warriors roster, and then I have a script that just loops through these, uploading them to S3. So I can run my upload, sorry, upload team function, and then I'll pass the browser instance and the Warriors roster. And that'll run the script and it'll just type in every name of every player that's on the Warriors. It'll get the image and then it'll upload it to S3. So this is the way that you can do like these kind of mass file imports just by pulling image data from somewhere, uploading them to S3. So if I refresh the browser now, we should see that in progress upload where we have Clay Thompson and Steph Curry and Kevin Durant already uploaded in the browser. And we do, we've got a lot of these players. And if I looked at Clay Thompson, for example, We'll see that there he is. So that is S3. The storage, by the way, in one of these buckets is effectively unlimited. You can store so much data in a single S3 bucket. And again, it's dynamic pricing, so you only pay for what you use, so it scales really nicely as you have usage. Anyway, I just upgraded my AV setup to level two which means I'm gonna be able to do a lot more multi-person content where you have multiple people in the room coding simultaneously. That content's gonna be really good. I'm gonna start recording meetups in San Francisco, interesting meetup talks and putting those on the channel too. You should really subscribe to this channel if you are interested in tech because there's gonna be really good content you can't get anywhere else. Or you can follow me on Twitter at alwaysbecoding. That's always a good idea. Anyways, peace.